So today we're going to talk about unification movements. So here are the terms. Make sure you get them and we will talk about them. Many early nationalists had been romantics like Lord The two most important unification movements occurred in Italy and Germany. And there was a parallel in both Italian and German unification. For example, territorial fragmentation had to be overcome, both political and territorial. Austria had to be removed from its dominant position in German and Italian affairs. 1848 was a great lesson. It showed that liberal and national ideas and popular revolts just weren't enough for unification. The lesson of 1848 was that Austria defeated Italian and German efforts at unification. Both Germany and Italy had a territorial nucleus or a core area to lead the way. In Italy, it was the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. In Germany, it was Prussia. And here you see Prussia and as you can see it's this entire area here and it's scattered. It's numerous states all kind of merged together. Both had strong leadership. In Italy, it was Count Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont Sardinia. In Germany, it was Otto von Bismarck, the Chancellor or Prime Minister of Prussia. Both of these statesmen took advantage of liberal and national ideals to strengthen their kingdoms. Then there's the idea of real politic, the politics of realism, using any means necessary to reach your goals, using any and all means to further your political goal or state interests. It's the pursuit of national goals by any means necessary, be they violent or illegal the national goal overrides any moral concern. So if any of you have ever read The Prince, think about one of the ideas of that book, The End Justifies the Means. That's what we see here. For Cavour and Bismarck, real politic consisted of secret diplomacy, lies and deceit, short and successful wars. In fact, war became the major catalyst for promoting a unified Italy and Germany. And in all of this, Habsburg Austria, the Austrian Empire, becomes the loser. She tries to recover her states and prestige by, I guess you could say, fishing in troubled waters, the Balkan Peninsula, but that's just going to create more problems down the road. Let's look at Italy. Italy was last unified in the 5th century. That's when the Roman Empire fell, in 476. It fell in 476. Italy and the rest of Europe was overrun by Germanic barbarian tribes um, who came in, conquered territory, created their own kingdoms, but in the process divided Italy up into numerous small kingdoms. And so it had been fragmented ever since then. It had been fragmented economically and politically for centuries. So in the 19th century, this period that we're talking about, it was a patchwork quilt of small states. In Italy, we see the idea of risorgimento. This meant the goal for a unified Italy. Risorgimento was the goal for a man named Giuseppe Mazzini. And here you see Mazzini. Um, he, it, it was his passion. Risorgimento was his passion. And in 1848, he tried to organize revolts, but they were snuffed out by Austria. He's important, though, because he laid the foundation for the future unification. He got that idea out there and laid the foundation. And his successor, Cavour, will take the process home. So who was Count Cavour? 
He was an aristocratic member of the nobility. He was responsible for ultimately unifying Italy. He had liberal leanings and was interested in tax and social reform. He was also interested in improving business in Italy. In the 1850s, Piedmont Sardinia had a constitutional monarchy. Cavour looked for ways to extend control over other Italian territories. And one way, he thought, was to make Piedmont Sardinia the model. Make it this perfect place, this perfect state that all the others will look to and want to be part of. So, he decided to do several things. Modernize it through reforms. Cavour was pragmatic and opportunistic. He was going to do whatever was necessary to reach his goals. He used war to strengthen his position against Austria. In 1859, Cavour allied with France and went to war against Austria. This was the Austro-Italian War. By 1860, Austria was defeated and Piedmont Sardinia had unified most of the Italian provinces. By 1870, Rome and Venice also became part of the new constitutional kingdom of Italy. Well, while Cavour was unifying the northern states, he was also secretly helping a nationalist, um, well one in particular, but other nationalist rebels in southern Italy. And in May of 1860, a small army of about 1,100 Italian nationalists sailed from Genoa to Sicily. They were led by a bold and romantic soldier named Giuseppe Garibaldi. In battle, Garibaldi always wore a bright red shirt. Since his followers imitated him, they became known as the Red Shirts. Garibaldi was victorious in Sicily, and he began marching northward. Volunteers flocked to him, and everywhere he was greeted as a liberator. And so, in some places, they actually fought, as you see in this painting, they actually fought for the independence of certain states. In others, he's, like I said, he's greeted as a liberator, governments collapsed, they come on board with the North. So Garibaldi continued to work his way northwards, unifying the southern territories, and he was victorious. He agreed to let the king of Piedmont Sardinia, who had been working with Cavour, rule the areas he had conquered. And so, in March 1861, the Italian parliament met and declared Victor Emmanuel II the king of Italy. The new nation had a government headed by a constitutional monarch and an elected parliament. So how was it done? Cavour used social and political reforms, secret diplomacy, for example, getting France as an ally, using Garibaldi, who was a secret ally, um, and he also used war. Cavour exploited whatever opportunities were available for specific state opportunities. So thanks to Cavour, the Italians gained a national state under one flag, instead of being divided into numerous provinces. By 1870, the last territories... So how about Germany? Ever since 1815, the Congress of Vienna, 39 German states had formed a German confederation. The two largest states, Austria and Prussia, dominated this loose grouping. Austria, earlier the home of the Holy Roman Emperor, was still considered the natural leader of Germany. Vienna, Austria's capital, was an important cultural center for German music, art, and literature. But, Austria faced some really serious problems. Most of the people in the Austrian Empire were not Germans. They were non-Germanic people. They yearned to break away. Austria also lagged behind Prussia in industrial development. 
Prussia, on the other hand, had everything to gain from nationalism. It had a mainly German population. It was the most industrial of the German states, and its army was by far the most powerful in Central Europe. So in regards to Germany, Prussia led the unification drive. It had many strengths. A well-trained officer corps. An efficient civil service and bureaucracy. An industrial base and growth along the Rhine River. This contributed to a modernizing, diversified economy. Then there's the Zollverein. This was a Prussian organized free trade area. It was an area of unrestricted trade and included all of the German states except Austria. It promoted trade, industry, and railroad building. And what people discovered was the economic ties to the Zollverein could forge political ties because you have all these states working together. Well, a lot of people believed that Prussian state interests had to be encouraged. It was felt that the Prussian king, Wilhelm I, the army, the government, all needed to be behind the cause of German unification. But the question was, who would reign supreme in German affairs? Increasingly, Prussia resented Austrian interference. And Austria's defeat in the Austro-Italian War of 1859 just strengthened Prussia's drive to get rid of Austria. Well, the king of Prussia, Wilhelm, came up with this bill called the Army Reform Bill. And this is in 1862. And this was a bill that would expand the officer corps and increase the number of years of service by recruits. So he comes up with this bill and he puts it forward to the Prussian parliament. They reject it. They're afraid it will create a stronger army, which would in turn be used to create an authoritarian state. So it led to a constitutional crisis. The king's frustrated, so he appoints a man to handle the crisis. He appoints Otto von Bismarck as prime minister or chancellor to deal with the situation. So who was Bismarck? He was an aristocrat. He had In 1864, we have the Danish War. And in this war, Austria and Prussia fought together against Denmark. The issue? Two provinces lying between Denmark and the German states, Schleswig and Holstein. Prussia's reformed army performed very well, and they win. Well, Bismarck had an ulterior motive. His whole purpose behind this war was to use Austria as an ally, but to actually ruffle her feathers. So Bismarck had an ulterior motive. He, the war was the Seven Weeks War in 1866 between Prussia and Austria. And as you can tell by the name, it didn't last very long, seven weeks. This is because Prussian forces had technological superiority over Austria. Prussia is one of the most industrialized nations in, the, in Europe at that time. Austria is not. And for the first time, we begin to see the destructive consequences of bringing technology into war. Prussia had at its disposal a well-connected railroad system, the telegraph, the needle gun. The Prussian army had more strength and speed. The result? Austria was defeated and removed from Germanic affairs. So Prussia, under Bismarck, created the North German Confederation. It consisted of all those states north of the Main River. It was 20-odd German states with an enlarged Prussia as the most important member. Politically, Bismarck's confederation had a constitution and a parliament. The real power, though, went to the king and the prime minister, along with the army. These two victorious wars, the Danish War and the Seven Weeks War, gave Bismarck most of the liberal support. 
he gave them what they wanted, a unified Germany. However, it's not all of Germany. There are still southern German states who have not come on board. And so Bismarck's not satisfied. He wants to get those southern states on board. He realizes they need something, a carrot or something, so to speak, to entice them into fighting together. So he continues to manufacture war. But first, he creates a lie. He claims that the French ambassador had personally insulted the Prussian king, demands an apology. The French refused to apologize. They said they hadn't done anything, which was actually the truth. Well, Bismarck used this opportunity to ally the southern states against France. He, other, he also continued with the lie. Now, these southern states resented the militarism of the north. Bismarck hoped to arouse their Germanism. So he raised fears of French expansion into the south, wanted them to look to the north for protection. And that's exactly what happens. He creates a war, the Franco-Prussian War. And during this war, the south looks to Bismarck and the north for protection. Napoleon III was the ruler of France at this time. And he fell for Bismarck's trap and runs headlong into war. One reason France comes into this war, France actually... So Bismarck uses this war to extend the German Confederation south of the Main River. France loses, has to pay reparations. France also has to hand over two of its border provinces, Alsace and Lorraine. These become part of the new Imperial Germany. By 1871, the Metternichian balance of power had been disrupted. The delicate work of the Congress of Vienna was put to rest. In 1871, at Versailles, the Germans declared themselves to be a single nation, a deeply conservative new German nation, with the king as the ultimate power. The chancellor would be his right hand, answerable only to the king. Bismarck's only concession to liberalism was the Reichstag, a representative legislative assembly. In reality, it wielded no power. Bismarck believed that a weak and powerless par um, parliament would be laughed out of existence. Bismarck's unified Germany was a victory for nationalism and conservatism. He forged a nationalist state with a conservative government. The German king or emperor would now be called the Kaiser. German unification marked a defeat for German liberalism. Bismarck had manipulated German nationalism. The new German nation or empire was known as the Second Reich. And that's R-E-I-C-H. They considered the Holy Roman Empire the First Reich. Bismarck became the new nation's first prime minister. The new German nation had a very solid economic foundation. By 1870, Germany was the world's third largest producer of manufactured goods, after Britain and the United States. After unification, German industry grew even faster, and soon it'll overtake Britain. So what's the legacy of all of this? Well, the weakness of German liberalism was critical to Hitler's rise to power in the 20th century, because there's no one to stop him. State interests justified short, successful wars. There's the idea that real politics could be used as political capital. That's a really dangerous way to think. And you could even say that, you know, perhaps 1914 and the outbreak of World War I occurred because Cavour and Bismarck had shown that short, successful wars worked. You gain a lot. And so that is how Germany came to be.